Hi, I'm Larry Black, and today we're looking back. About 20 years ago, I had an idea to get a room filled with country music people, singers, songwriters, put together 30 of them. They love to tell stories. They love to share with each other. And today, they get to share with you. This is Looking Back with Larry Black. Hey, you found us again, Looking Back with Larry Black. Today, we're going to explore some of the great, funny stories of Roger Miller. Oh, you're going to love the people that share the stories and the stories themselves. So settle back. We haven't mentioned we it. The good. a guy that I know, Justin, that so many people in this room knew so well. Such a wonderful guy, such a quick wit and such a talent, our buddy Roger Miller. Oh, yeah. I bet we could tell oh. Roger Miller stories from that the cows come oh, home. Yeah. He was at a, at a guitar pool one time where they were just passing the guitars around and singing, and he was on a roll. He was singing one of his hits right after another, and boy, the crowd was just getting into it, and every song was a little better than the one before. Roger stopped after about four songs, and he hit a chord on his guitar. He said, now here's a little song I wrote while I was singing that last one. <laughs> hey, Bill, this is a little piece of history I'll share with you. It was in Boise, Idaho, in Marvin Rainwater, and Roger Miller was on the tour, and myself and Mel Tillis. And it was, uh, Roger had two big hits, and man, he was so excited, and we was all happy for him. So Roger told me, he said, Merle, let's rent a big suite, it has a big living room, and we'll have the bedrooms on each side, and, uh, and we'll have some fun tonight. Well, this disc jockey, who I had met several times, he said, Merle, can I roar with you guys? And I said, well, I don't know. You know, Roger's kind of funny, man. You know, if you ask him a lot of questions, you know, being a disc jockey and want to do uh, liners and interviews, I swear I'll just sit in the corner and I'll be nice. And I said, okay. So Marvin and I had an assignment to write a song for Carl Smith because Carl says, Merle, I swear, he turned down about 50 of my songs and he says, I'm going to record whatever you send me, I will record it on the next session. So Marvin and I came up with this song called, Why Can't You Feel Sorry For Me? And we were so excited writing it, and Roger kept opening the door and said, uh, uh, listen, I'm working on something. I said, uh, could you excuse us a minute, Rog? Marvin and I are writing a smash here. Why can't you feel sorry for me? He said, listen to this thing I got. Trailers for sale or rent, da 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 da. 50 cents. I said, I don't like traitors. Like a he said, oh, I'm sorry. He went back in his bedroom and started writing. So Marvin and I finished yeah. up the song, and Roger came back out, and he, he gave us a few more lines of King of the Road. And the disc jockey that was sitting there was Boxcar Willie. Oh, wow. <laughs> what a story. I got to know Roger here before he ever made it really big. And so we'd become kind of buddies. And... Uh, it may seem unbelievable now, but there was a time Nashville didn't have really good string sections. So I'd cut tracks here and go out to L.A. and put strings on. And Gene Autry owned the uh, Continental Hotel, and that's where most of the music people stayed. And I'd been out there about a week and had finished all my sessions and had a flight booked the next morning early back to Nashville. And I was just going to rest that evening and get up early. The phone rang, and it's Roger. He said, welcome to Hollyweird. <laughs> yeah. He said, I've got an idea. I've got to come over. I said, okay. So he came over and he said, we, and you know, there's money in records. I know that now. I'm getting royalty checks. But there's more money in commercials. You man, you get residuals. It just keeps on going. He said, you know, somebody wrote that Pepsi commercial and made millions of dollars. Let's write a hit commercial. <laughs> I said, well, uh, what do you want to write it about? He said, oh, we got to have a big company. So we settled on Ford. So we stayed up all night. Now, and I'm really tired now. And he's not seemingly tired. You know, he had a little <laughs> artificial stimulation. So about daylight, I said, I've got to cancel my flight if, or, or something here. He said, well, cancel it. I've got a phone here in my briefcase. He says, the first portable phone I've ever seen. Call the airlines, cancel. He said, here, take a couple of these. This will, you know, keep you awake a while. <laughs> So uh, by about 3 o'clock that afternoon, I don't know how many he'd given me. He'd say, what color do you want now? I don't know. <laughs> you know. So we were up all that night. Sometime the next day, I said, what are we doing? He said, we're writing a hit commercial. And I said, well, what about? He said, forward. But let's hurry up and finish this thing because I'm getting tired of it. And we was paper everywhere on the floor of the hotel room. So I said, Lord, give me a line. 
And I said, uh, F-O-U-R-D. He said, what's that? I said, that's you and a Ford. We've done it. It's a hit. I'm calling J. Walter Thompson. And he tried to get him on the phone and everything. And then he would get sidetracked, you know, and he said, you like Willie Nelson, don't you? I said, well, yeah, Willie's great. Yeah, well, Willie flushes to the beat of a different plumber. <laughs> and he just thing, you know, he just one line you that. It was great. Roger went up behind Ronnie Millsap and put his hands over his ears and said, guess who? <laughs> He was stopped by a traffic cop, and the cop says, uh, can I see your license? And Roger says, can I shoot your gun? <laughs> true story. True story. It's, if I ever told the truth of my life. I lived in Studio City, and Roger called me. He was already popular by now. He said, I want you to go to the dentist with me. I said, okay. And he came over. He had a brand new... Rolls Royce convertible with the top down. He says, get in. Smell new. Drove out to the Van Nuys airport, out onto the tarmac. We got out and got onto a Learjet. We took off and 20 minutes later we landed in Las Vegas. Meeting the plane was a limousine about a quarter of a mile long. Drove <laughs> us down to the Sahara Hotel where there were two suites waiting, already booked. So he said, go on up to the suite, I'll be back in a minute. So in about a half an hour, he came back, and his dentist was in Las Vegas. And he had chipped his tooth, and it took him about a half hour to fix it, and he came back. He said, well, we're here, what do you want to do? I said, Roger, tomorrow I have a radio show. I don't have a toothbrush. I don't have any money. I have to go to work. I want to go home. He said, okay. Okay. We got back in the limousine, drove back to the airport. We got on the Learjet and flew back to Van Nuys Airport. We got into the, the Rolls Royce convertible. He drove me up to my front door, and as I got out, he said, thanks for going to the dentist with me. <laughs> Justin Tubb, you wrote some songs with Roger. Y'all wrote a big hit together. Uh, yeah, we wrote several songs together. I guess the one that most people know was uh, Johnny Wright did the first record on it back in 1964 and uh, then nothing happened for about 25 years and Highway 101 recorded it called name? Walking, Talking, Crying, Barely Beating, Broken Heart. Oh, yeah. 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 But Roger and I spent a lot of time together back in the early days. We both came to Tree about the same time as writers and uh, uh, we even shared a, a house for a couple of weeks one time when our wives kicked us both out at the same time. <laughs> but uh, I was at a guitar pool one time at Dottie West house out in Englewood. Uh, she and Bill lived out there then, and I thought Hank Cochran was there, and Harlan Howard, and me and Dottie, and maybe Patsy Cline was even there. I'm not sure, but uh, Roger was supposed to have come, and he wasn't there yet. And pretty soon, uh, the phone rang, and Roger said, "Hey, I'm running late, but I'll be there as quick as I can." And we hung up the phone. About that time, the doorbell rang or a knock on the door, and we opened up, and there he was. And he had that phone you were talking about in that briefcase. And that was the first one I'd ever seen. He was out on the front porch when he called. <laughs> but uh, when I went to the memorial that they had for Roger at the uh, Ryman after he passed away, uh, Marty Stewart said something and hit the nail right on the head. Uh, Roger's wit and his, his mind worked so fast that sometimes it got ahead of him. And if you remember, every time Roger would say something funny, he would laugh harder than anybody. And Marty said he, he, he is sure that the reason of, for that is that his mind worked so fast, he didn't know what he was going to say until it was already out. And then that was the first time that he'd heard it, you know. And he laughed as hard as anybody. <laughs> Dickens, Dickens has got a great one, too. We were doing a, a guitar pull similar to what we're doing right now. Uh, one time, it was a tribute to Sue Brewer. Everybody knew Sue. She was a friend of everybody in country music. And Willie was there, and, and Merle Kilgore, and Webb Pierce, and Waylon Jennings. And everybody would take the guitar and sing one verse, of course, of a song that Sue liked of theirs. Mm -hmm. And everybody did their thing, and then they handed me the guitar, and I sang a verse and chorus of Take Me As I Am or Let Me Go. And everybody clapped their hands, and oh, well, that was good. And everything even got real quiet, and Roger said, 
Boy, I wish I'd have been here. I might have enjoyed that. <laughs> I, I was putting up, he used to live two doors from me in East Nashville. And that one day I was in the yard putting up a swing set for my little girl. And he pulled up in the driveway and got out and said, how you doing? I said, oh, this thing's driving me crazy. I said, I put a bolt in here and 10 minutes later I find out it's going over here somewhere. I'm about to go crazy. He said, you know what your problem is? I said, no, what? He said, you're standing too close to it. You're getting the feedback. <laughs> I love what he told Johnny Cash that time. He said, don't ever put your pills and your change in the same pocket. He said, I just swallowed 35 cents. <laughs> don't forget to hit that subscribe button. We have more coming just for you. Larry Black, looking back. Remember to remember.